Hello and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. Whoopi Goldberg has been suspended from the talk show The View. It comes after she argued the Holocaust was not about race. The co-host has since apologized. Senators on the Judiciary Committee considering three of President Biden's judicial nominees. What are some senators concerned about? The Louisiana governor responds to an article accusing him of covering up a death in police custody. He says he's kept quiet because of the investigation. And breeding pigs now have more space in California under a new law, but some pigs will have to wait after grocers and restaurant owners sued to to delay the implementation. Co-host of The View, Whoopi Goldberg, has been suspended for controversial remarks about the Holocaust. The president of ABC News says Goldberg is suspended for two weeks so she can reflect on her remarks. Goldberg said on Monday that the Holocaust wasn't about race, but was about man's inhumanity to man. She later apologized on Twitter, saying that she should have said it was about both. Tuesday evening, ABC News president Kim Godwin announced that Goldberg was suspended, calling her statements wrong and hurtful. Godwin said, while Whoopi has apologized, I've asked her to take time to reflect and learn about the impact of her comments. Jewish groups condemned Goldberg's remarks, saying they belittled Jewish suffering. For example, the chairman of the World Holocaust Remembrance Center responded. He said Goldberg's remarks reflect a lack of understanding that Hitler persecuted the Jews because he saw the Jews as an inferior race. Whether we are a race or not, that's irrelevant. They saw us as a race that was racist persecution. I saw the clarification of Ms. Goldberg. It is important, it's educational, but it is not enough. She should come to Yad Vashem. I invite her, other influencers, to educate themselves thoroughly about the Holocaust. They will not leave the same person. And a director of an organization that combats anti-Semitism is concerned that the viewers of The View won't know about the apology. Well, we're thankful she apologized. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't know how many viewers of The View know about that apology. They might be remembering what she said. And that's always a challenge when when, when lies can actually spread so much faster uh, than truth. Though the president of the Center for Civil and Human Rights says she empathizes with what Goldberg was saying. I think that the Holocaust is an example of man's inhumanity to man. The Nazis set it up as being about racial hatred, but really about racial hierarchy. Um, But the Jews are not a race. Judaism is a religion. It's like saying Christians are a race or Catholics are a race. So the Holocaust was really perpetrated against the Jews by religious persecution. ABC News said it stands in solidarity with the Jewish people. The Senate Judiciary Committee on Tuesday considered three of Biden's nominees for U.S. District Judge. Republicans focused on one Californian candidate in particular. And today's Jessica Beatty has the details. Senate Republicans Tuesday grilled Judge Kenley Kiyokato about her views as they considered her nomination by President Biden. Senator Ted Cruz asked Kato if she thinks racial discrimination is wrong. Our Constitution prohibits race discrimination, discrimination on the basis of race. Let me ask again, is racial discrimination wrong? Senator, as a judge, I, I, I don't... Um, deal with issues of morality or whether something... So you have no views on whether it's right or wrong? Kato didn't directly answer, saying it's an issue that's frequently litigated before the courts. If confirmed, Kato would be a federal judge in Los Angeles. Senator Josh Hawley asked her about her views on illegal immigration, saying he was concerned about some statements she had made as a public defender, reportedly telling LA Weekly that illegal immigrants didn't do anything wrong. Do you not do, have you changed your view since then? Is that what the implication? My role has changed. For the past seven and a half years, I've served as a sitting United States magistrate judge. And my record demonstrates that I was able to put aside my advocacy role And now my role is solely one where my duty of loyalty is to the law and the law alone. Holly also asked her if she agreed that fraud and illegal immigration are crimes because they make up a large portion of her docket. Senator, number one, as former counsel to those individuals, it would be inappropriate for me to make the type of statement that you are requesting. Democrats praised Cato and the two other district court nominees, Jennifer Roshan and Sunshine Sykes, 
as experienced lawyers whose appointments they said would diversify the bench. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. President Biden's pick to lead the Federal Communications Commission is facing further questioning. A vote for her nomination was delayed after her activities as the head of a nonprofit were revealed. Another confirmation hearing for nominee Gigi Sohn will likely focus on her activities with nonprofit Locust. The organization was sued by ABC, NBC, Fox, and CBS for copyright violations. Locust took broadcast content from those networks and provided it to people who could not afford cable television subscriptions. Sohn said what she did was legal since Locust was a nonprofit, but a judge sided against that claim, and Locust was forced to shut down. Sohn later agreed to a settlement deal with the TV networks, doing so just one day after Biden named her as his choice to lead the federal regulator. Senators at the next hearing could bring up a conflict of interest, while Fox suggests the settlement deal could have been influenced by the potential nomination. Does the Build Back Better plan need to be rebuilt? On Tuesday, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin called the White House backed legislation, quote, dead. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki is keeping tight lipped about the talks between the administration and the senator from West Virginia. As you know, as a policy, we're not going to get into private conversations we have with Senator Manchin or any other senators about this, uh, this piece of legislation uh, or our efforts moving forward. Manchin says the roughly $2 trillion Build Back Better bill is too expensive and could further fuel inflation. He also says he's not sure if he would support a smaller version of the bill. Other Democrats say the bill would help families handle rising costs by using federal aid to pay for their health care and education costs. Drug maker Johnson & Johnson, along with three major U.S. drug distributors on Tuesday, settled legal claims made by hundreds of Native American tribes. The tribes allege the companies fueled an opioid epidemic in their communities. J&J and distributors McKesson, Amerisource Bergen, and Cardinal Health have agreed to pay the tribes $590 million. The companies had previously proposed settling for $26 billion over similar claims from states and local governments, but it failed to address lawsuits by the over 500 Native American tribes and Alaskan Native villages in the country. Under the new settlement, the three distributors will have to pay off over $400 million over seven years. But Johnson & Johnson still denies wrongdoing, calling its prescription opioid painkillers appropriate. So far, more than 3,000 lawsuits have been filed seeking to hold drug companies responsible for the opioid abuse. The epidemic has led to hundreds of thousands of overdose deaths over the past 20 years. Is your family among the more than 60 million U.S. households that have ordered a free at-home COVID-19 test kit? If so, it may be made in China. Over one-third of the kits are. This has sparked criticism from some members of Congress who say relying on China for medical supplies is a national security threat. NTD's Grace Coulter has the details on the kits and what can be done to bring more manufacturing to the U.S. Of the 1 billion at-home COVID-19 test kits being sent to Americans by the Biden administration, about one-third are from a Chinese manufacturer. Just over 350 million kits are from iHealth Labs, a California subsidiary of Chinese medical gear manufacturer Andon Health. The company has won contracts for the White House rollout worth roughly $1.8 billion. And while this has been touted by Chinese state media, not everyone is happy about it. Congressman Rob Whitman told the Epic Times that the U.S. should be supporting hardworking Americans and businesses and not relying on unfriendly regimes. Whitman, a Republican, said in an email to the outlet, if we should have learned anything from this pandemic, it is that it's imperative to break U.S. dependence on Chinese medical and personal protective equipment supply chains. Congressman Brad Wenstrup expressed a similar view and described the reliance on China for medical supplies as a national security issue as well as a national health security issue. I think the bigger question is why aren't we manufacturing more stuff here? Gerald Comis Young is the CEO of Todos Medical. His company manufactures COVID-19 tests in China, Korea and the U.S. He says it's not surprising that the administration is sourcing tests from China because, he says, the cost is much higher in the U.S. He says this is due to a lack of automation and infrastructure and says it's up to the government to work with U.S. companies to fix this. There were many plans uh, that existed before. I personally know several 
mask manufacturers that were supposed to have loans guaranteed by the SBA uh, that those loans fell through and therefore they did not set up those mask manufacturing plants. I'm certain uh, that it's the same for uh, test kits. I, uh, we were looking at doing manufacturing ourselves and it became so burdensome uh, because the faith that there would be a market for these tests was so low that nobody would finance it. Uh, and therefore, we didn't do it. And, and therefore, when we buy kits, we have to buy them from some subsidiary of a Chinese company. Commerce Young says it's incumbent upon the government to make funding available or guaranteed loans to allow U.S. manufacturers to grow so that the products can be made here. Congressman Whitman is calling for the administration and members of Congress to lead by example and advocate for medical equipment to be made at home. Grace Coulter, NTD News. New disclosures are coming from North Carolina's Board of Elections. That's as records show foreigners registered to vote and actually voted in the state's elections. The disclosure announcement is part of legal settlement with an electoral integrity group. It comes weeks after an individual was arrested and charged. A Bahamas native, the person is accused of falsely claiming to be a U.S. citizen in order to register to vote, voting by an alien, and passport fraud. Authorities say the person voted in every primary and general election from 2018 through 2020. The legal complaint was first filed in June 2019 against the North Carolina State Board of Elections and its executive director. The Public Interest Legal Foundation brought the lawsuit. The group also says it uncovered records showing foreigners voting across the United States. And CNN CEO Jeff Zucker has just announced his resignation effective immediately. He says he failed to disclose an office relationship with a former aide to Andrew Cuomo, New York's former governor, who stepped down amidst a sexual harassment scandal. The network says they will announce an interim leadership plan soon. U.S. Senator Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico is expected to make a full recovery after suffering a stroke. He was hospitalized last week after he began to experience dizziness and fatigue. The 49-year-old Democrat checked himself into a hospital in Santa Fe on Thursday. His chief of staff says the senator was then transferred to a hospital in Albuquerque for further evaluation. He then underwent decompressive surgery to ease the swelling he was experiencing. According to his office, Lohan remains in the hospital and is expected to make a full recovery. The Louisiana governor responds to an Associated Press investigation, which found he stayed silent about the death of a black motorist in police custody. It accuses the governor of not wanting to ruin his chances at re-election. Before the videos were made public, I declined to characterize them. Not because my opinion was different then than it is today, but because I had been asked by the U.S. Department of Justice that videos not be made public so as not to interfere or interrupt, compromise their investigation. I believe their request applied to my thoughts about the videos as well. According to the AP report, Edwards received a text message from the head of state troopers informing him that Ronald Green had died. That's after what was described as a violent, lengthy struggle with police after crashing his car. The message said Green had been driving over 110 miles per hour. AP says police told Green's family that he died in a car crash. The AP report accuses Edwards of allowing police to lie up until the point AP obtained and released body cam footage. The video shows Green getting punched, jolted with stun guns, and dragged. The governor of Oregon agreed to temporarily stop granting clemency to felons. A group composed of relatives of murder victims is suing her for what they call excessive use of clemency powers. Governor Kate Brown has released almost 1,000 convicts early over the past two years. The law firm representing the families asked her to halt the practice until March 2nd. It expects the lawsuits to have been played out by then. The governor is accused of failing to properly notify the victims' families about released felons and of illegally lending state agencies her clemency powers. The relatives of three murder victims are involved in the lawsuit. A judge is giving the governor and state agencies until February 16th to respond. A hearing is scheduled for February 28th. 
Get used to the cold. Punxsutawney Phil emerged from his burrow Wednesday to see his shadow. That means six more weeks of winter. With my shadow I have cast, then a long, lustrous six more weeks of winter. Every February 2nd, Americans wait with bated breath for the Pennsylvania Groundhog's prognostication. According to Phil's website, he's been predicting the seasons since 1887. Legend has it, if he sees his shadow, we can expect cold temps to continue. If he doesn't, an early spring is on the way. The National Centers for Environmental Information doesn't give Phil a passing grade for accuracy, saying over the past 10 years, he's only been right 40% of the time. The skies are not being friendly to those with travel plans. Airlines are once again canceling flights ahead of an expected new blast of winter weather. The flight tracking site FlightAware reported nearly 3,000 flights have been nixed nationwide. Today, more than 1,300 flights were canceled at airports, including those in Chicago, St. Louis, and Detroit. Add to that, over 1,600 more flights have already been canceled for Thursday, as the storm is expected to target Texas. The powerful winter storm is expected to slam communities from the Midwest to the East Coast with ice, rain, sleet, and snow. The water contained in California's mountain snow is dropping. Now it's lower than the historical average. That's after a lack of major rain or snow last month. The water in Sierra Nevada mountain snowpack is at 92% of what's normal. That's a dramatic reversal from December when heavy rain and snow left the state with 160 percent of its average snow water content. The state measures snow totals electronically and manually at hundreds of locations. The nation's most populous state needs a wet winter to ease California's drought. Though this year's dry conditions are less dire so far than they were a year ago. Winter snow is a crucial part of California's water supply. Snow melts in the mountains and runs down to lower elevations, making up about a third of the state's water supply. Most of California is now under what's called severe drought, while a small part of the state is classified in the more serious extreme drought category. Up next, the Super Bowl's approaching and preparations are underway at Los Angeles SoFi Stadium, where the Los Angeles Rams will soon face the Cincinnati Bengals. And giant lettuce-loving rabbits join a salad-eating contest in California Despite these seemingly fierce and fuzzy competition, the results may surprise you. All that and more coming up here on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Cancel culture has not only affected myself and MyPillow, but also millions of you out there. My employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you for all your support. At MyPillow, we have hundreds of products now, including my new slippers, bathrobes, sleepwear, and my new beds. We are offering the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have the standard size My Pillows, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get custom fit with my premium queen size My Pillows, regularly $79.98, now just $29.98. Or my king size, regularly $89.98, now just $34.98. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive these exclusive offers. Thank you and God bless.
The Super Bowl is fast approaching and preparations are in full swing at Los Angeles SoFi Stadium. Workers were busy Tuesday preparing for the field for a face-off between the Los Angeles Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals in a couple of weeks. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. As workers painted Super Bowl 56 logos and yard lines on the field, Katie Keaton, the NFL Senior Director of Events, explained why there's so much excitement around this year's game. You know, we've got a full stadium, you know, we've got a new stadium, we've got a big city, we've got the home team, you know, a host team, um, a home team, sorry, in the game. You know, you add on all of those elements, all of the halftime show talent. It will be the Rams' second Super Bowl appearance in four seasons. Before this year, the Bengals had not won a playoff game since 1991. They're one of 12 teams that have never won a Super Bowl, but they have been revived by second-year quarterback Joe Burrow. And the, this season also has just been amazing, right? The games this weekend were amazing. So, you know, the football is going to be great, and we've got some amazing stars in the game, and, you know, really good stories around that. So we're just really excited. Fans attending the game will be required to wear a mask and show proof of vaccination or a recent negative test but there will be no capacity restrictions at the 70,000-seat venue in Inglewood. The NFL and Los Angeles County health officials said they would host a vaccination clinic and give out free tests at the Los Angeles Convention Center on February 5th and 6th and February 10th through the 12th. We're working really closely with the LA County Health Department to put in place the protocols for the game. You know, it'll be uh, vaccination required or a negative test required for access into the game, and then we will require masks in the stadium. So, you know, we've been we've hosted now millions of fans throughout the season uh, safely and we feel confident we can do that on Super Bowl Sunday as well. Super Bowl 56 is set for Sunday, February 13th. This year's halftime show will feature Mary J. Blige, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Kendrick Lamar, and Eminem. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The Washington NFL football team has spent two years deciding on a new team name. Today, they're revealing the final pick. What do fans have to say about it? The National Football League's Washington, D.C. football team has finally made the name change, a move that comes as no surprise to fans. I feel like that was a big move for football, for the NFL. I think it was a good move for the NFL um, to, you know, be a more inclusive, you know, organization. Um, so I'm glad that they made that decision. Like many American professional and college sports teams, the club once had a name derived from indigenous peoples, the Redskins but it had long been denounced as a racial slur against Native Americans. The club held out on changing its name until mid-2020, when one of their naming rights sponsors urged the NFL team to rebrand. Since then, the team has been known as Washington Football Team, with the official name and logo left undetermined. I thought it was pretty bold, you know, to change it to the football team. And I know a lot of people were, like, thinking it was kind of a goofy name. During the rebranding, the names of Wolves or Red Wolves topped the list of name suggestions but the name Commanders was officially settled on, ruling out both options. Most fans seem to be fine with it. Can't say that really gets me up and going, but it's better than Redskins. Uh, it's got a, a nice feel to it. Uh, people get used to it and just deal with it. I feel like when you decide to, you want a strong name to go with a name like Commanders, like just just very in your face strong. So I don't know if I necessarily love the name, but, but yeah, Commander is better than Redskins. Let's just put it that way. The Washington Redskins were formerly known as the Boston Braves, founded in 1932. They changed the name to the Redskins the following year and moved to Washington, D.C. in 1937. A unique salad eating contest in California brought in some unusual contestants, giant rabbits. But instead of taking home the gold, the lettuce-loving bunnies met with defeat instead. Let's take a look. Two, one! A giant lettuce-loving rabbit named Honey Bunny has met its match. Nicknamed Mega, the oversized critter lost a salad-eating contest to a human woman. Salad franchise Chop Stop organized the competition in Glendale, California. I remember seeing these ridiculous pictures on the internet of people holding these massive rabbits. I did a little research and I found out there was uh, a local guy who actually breeds those. They're called Flemish Giants rabbits. So I contacted him and it was a match made in heaven. Honey Bunny, the giant rabbit, virtually froze in front of the lettuce tray, barely eating anything at all. The organizers then allowed the Honey Team to bring in a backup contestant, Precious. But that rabbit also failed to eat a single leaf. Their keeper said he wasn't surprised at the outcome. 
Rabbits are not scarfers. They're not like dogs, just scarf it down quickly. They're nibblers. They nibble all day, all night. So they eat decent amounts, but over a period of time. The winner, Reina Huang, has been competing in eating contests for four years. But the girl says she doesn't eat salad at all outside of competitions. It, it was more of like a challenge to myself. Um, when I do contests and challenges, usually I don't really pay attention too much to what competitors do. I think the best for me is just to see how the best of what I can do. To win the competition, Huang managed to put away three and a half pounds of chopped salad within 10 minutes. In California, an animal welfare law has been partially delayed by grocers and restaurateurs. They argue that it will increase the price of pork. But the measure has been welcomed by farmers raising their pigs in pasture and organic shops. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. California's breeding pigs are now enjoying more living space. Since January 1st, a law requires them to be given enough space to stand and turn around. It's hard to look at a confinement pig operation and then look at this and go, can we at least have something in the middle there? You know, can we at least move in that direction? But a judge had partially delayed the implementation of the law. Grocers and restaurateurs successfully sued to put off its enforcement. It won't apply to them for whole pork meat sales until six months after the state enacts final regulations. This is, it's being driven by consumer demand. You kind of have to, you can say all you want about whether it's a political issue or whatever, but the voters voted, right? The law stemmed from a 2018 ballot measure where California voters set the country's toughest living space standards for breeding pigs. I understand why the voters voted for that. The way that the animals are cared for and kept is not right. Um, at Avedanos, we've never kept animals or gotten animals that are kept like that. Pork producers and suppliers which sell pork in the state remain subject to enforcement if they violate square footage requirements that went into effect on January 1st. The law is expected to lead to a price hike. We want what's best, but we also then have to transfer that onto the prices on our menu. And then, you know, we're kind of in a weird spot because we're looked at as breakfast, diner kind of atmosphere. We've been here for 32 years, so we're a bit of institution. So. People want nickel eggs still, so <laughs> we're just not going to happen. So when we raise our prices, it becomes a big deal. An estimate last year from North Carolina State University found the new standard would cost about 15% more per animal for a farm with 1,000 breeding pigs. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. U.S. Olympic team freestyle skier Kai Owens fell and injured her face during a practice run on Tuesday. According to a Reuters photographer, she appeared to lose consciousness for a moment. Owens is a 17-year-old Colorado skier who was born in China but was raised in the United States. She is due to compete in the Mogul Qualifications event on Thursday. The Reuters photographer at the scene saw a man in a Team France jacket approach Owens to assist. Owens appeared for a few seconds to be unconscious but quickly regained her footing and was able to ski down. And 10,000 people in one Chinese city transported to a quarantine center. Thousands were seen lining up for hours in the rain, including parents with babies and the elderly. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. New reports from the southern Chinese city of Hanzhou are painting a dreary picture. That's as nearly 10,000 people lined up outside for hours, waiting in the rain to be quarantined. Friday afternoon, the city opted to send residents from two communities into controlled quarantine. A company located in one of them was found to have several positive Omicron infections. And many of the company's workers also live locally. Over 9,000 residents live there. City officials touted the move, saying they transferred 300 busloads containing nearly all residents to isolation centers. But residents suffer a lot from the rush transfer. Men and women, young and old, a two-month-old baby in its mother's arms, all put under quarantine. They also transferred old people in wheelchairs. A post complaint reads that residents had to line up in the rain for a couple of hours and then were packed into the bus and continued waiting for another hour. For those under quarantine, there is no way for them to get out.
They won't let you out. As for supplies, they put a stool at your door, knock on your door, and put the meals on the stool. Some residents doubt the massive transfer will lead to more infections. But the authorities don't seem to care. Some are commenting, for the government, it's okay if you don't die in the city. That's what they call basically zero cases. Dr. Zhang from Beijing Judicial System says the so-called basically zero case is merely a word game. They will transfer all potential positive cases outside the city, thus to create a basically zero case situation in the city. Hangzhou reported 13 new cases the last day of January. All are found in the centrally controlled quarantine site. Due to the Chinese communist regime's history of cover-up, NTD cannot verify the real number of the cases. And while some must stop working to quarantine, it seems others must continue working, but without pay. But now they are speaking up. An angry crowd broke into the building of a real estate company. They had been begging for days outside. The group says they are owed wages. They are mostly migrant workers. And in the southern Chinese province of Guangxi, another group held banners asking for their wages. Some of these migrant workers turned to local officials for help. In the central Chinese city of Luoyang, another group of migrant workers held signs begging for the money owed to them. It's not only the migrant workers who suffer. A video shows a group of people gathering in front of an agricultural bank of China building. They appear to be accusing the bank of illegal lending. The group alleged that an illegal operation cost them their homes. They say they're appealing to the authorities, but that it's hard for them to have a voice. Thousands of families reportedly became homeless due to the bank's actions. No word yet as to the bank's response. Coming up, a Taiwanese company hatches an idea to address the medical waste generated during the pandemic by turning used masks into wireless phone chargers. Stay tuned to find out more. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future, to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep, or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility, and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money, physical gold and silver because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. All right, guys, you have signed up, right? You've joined freedomsquare.com. If you haven't, why not? This should have happened a decade ago. How did somebody not think of this earlier? If you're a business owner, we have a business directory to promote your business to patriots across the nation. So if you want to buy American, if you want to sell American, we have a business directory. Whatever it is, go now. Join us in the fight for freedom. Welcome to Freedom Square. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shenyun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. The 2022 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. President Joe Biden has formally approved additional U.S. military deployments to Eastern Europe, 
It's meant as a show of support to NATO allies feeling threatened by Russia's military movements near Ukraine. U.S. officials say the deployment will be in the coming days. We are moving uh, an additional force of about approximately 2,000 troops from the United States to Europe in the next few days. This force is trained and equipped for a variety of missions to deter aggression and to reassure and to defend our allies. The U.S. and NATO already have tens of thousands of troops in Europe, some of which will be relocated to Eastern Europe. NATO has not yet activated a multinational response force as diplomatic efforts to de-escalate tensions continue. The Pentagon also reacting to the leak of confidential documents the U.S. and NATO sent to Russia last week. A leading Spanish newspaper published the written responses Wednesday. In them, the U.S. and NATO reject Moscow's demand to block Ukraine's potential admission to NATO. But they offer to negotiate measures of mutual trust on security issues. Today, the Pentagon's press secretary says the documents are authentic. The United States has gone the extra mile to find a diplomatic solution. And if Russia actually wants to negotiate a solution as it claims it does, this document certainly makes clear that there is a path forward to do so. According to the newspaper, the U.S. and NATO's responses were to a draft treaty that Russia had sent to them back in December. France has entered the first phase of easing COVID-19 restrictions as the country witnesses a stabilization of the Omicron wave. And all sports and cultural venues will be allowed to operate both indoors and outdoors, and there won't be any limit to the number of people that can attend, provided they wear masks. The outdoor mask mandate also ends on Wednesday, and working from home will no longer be mandatory, but recommended. In a second phase, starting February 16th, Nightclubs can reopen their doors to the public and concerts will be allowed again. The relaxation of COVID-19 measures comes as France is still witnessing a high number of COVID-19 infections. An average of over 300,000 cases have been reported daily in the past week. However, there has been a stabilization of intensive care unit cases. Today is February 2nd, 2022, considered an auspicious day. Many couples in Germany are taking the plunge and officially starting their lives together today. Celine and Philip are newlyweds from the northern German city of Cologne. The couple says their unique wedding date will make remembering their anniversary a breeze. Another couple also chose the numerically unique wedding date. The bride says two is her lucky number. The date, packed with four twos, carries an auspicious meaning and the marriage registry office in Cologne busier than ever. One registrar says the number of appointments was specifically higher compared to February in past years. To cope with the demand, extra wedding rooms. But now they too are full. Today also marks the second day of the Lunar New Year, the tiger. In the Chinese culture, the year is associated with the animal's attributes like bravery, confidence, and strong will. A company in Taiwan has created a new wireless phone charger made from used face masks. This is part of an effort to tackle the massive amount of medical waste produced during the pandemic. Face masks have been one of the most used pieces of personal protective equipment during the pandemic. But they're also a source of worldwide pollution, producing harmful plastic and other waste that may end up in landfills, sewage systems, or oceans. This COVID-19 pandemic uh, creates so much waste. A lot of single-use waste, especially all the plastic waste that's actually used to protect ourselves. And these plastic waste, especially the mask, is actually almost 100% made from plastic. It's polypropylene based. A Taiwanese company is turning used masks into something valuable, a new type of wireless phone charger. They developed a machine called Trash Presso. It combines a shredder, compressor, and mechanical arm to automatically produce part of the chargers. So the material itself can be reused, upcycled constantly, except you need to have a, on the front end, you need to be able to load the material smartly and you need to be able to get the data. So then from the data of the material, then you are able to use the system to transform that in a mechanical way without all these uh, additional chemical pollution. The robots shred the masks, heat them and turn them into plastic dough. They're also used to make the charger's plastic shell before getting assembled with other electronic parts. 
Taiwanese bank Fubon Financial is a partner of the company. The bank is now testing these wireless phone chargers among all its employees. We collected around 10,000 masks. Added with material provided by MiniWiz, we made over 40,000 chargers for our employees. Our employees were very happy to get this present because each charger was different because they were made with recycled masks. A recent World Health Organization report says the world generated more than tens of thousands of tons of medical waste in response to the pandemic. That includes personal protective equipment, test kits, vaccine syringes, needles, and safety boxes. And if not handled properly, they pose a health risk to both humans and the environment. Just ahead, many Australians are leaving the dairy farming industry each year, but one father and son are bucking national trends. One of the world's top ski resorts in Austria has a rich history. It was at this resort that ski pioneers developed revolutionary techniques, among them the precursor to the parallel turn. Find out more after the short break. NASA is retiring the International Space Station after three decades in orbit. The agency is planning to crash the ISS into the most remote part of the Pacific Ocean in January 2031. The area, known as Point Nemo, has been the crash site for hundreds of pieces of space debris over the years. Since launching in the year 2000, the ISS has orbited 227 nautical miles above Earth. It's been a temporary home to more than 200 astronauts from 19 countries. Without the ISS, NASA will rely on the private sector to help continue scientific research in space. Hundreds are leaving the dairy farming industry each year, but an Australian father and son are bucking national trends. They're buying dairy farms to enjoy what they say is a more balanced lifestyle. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. More than 75% of Australia's dairy farms have closed their gates in the past 40 years, according to Dairy Australia. But at 72, Stan Johnson has become a dairy farmer. It's a good lifestyle because I can keep doing it, and I'm hoping I can keep doing something on this farm for another 10 to 15 years. When he was dairy farming 35 years ago, there were almost 22,000 dairies across the country. Now, there are fewer than 5,000. Hundreds are still leaving the industry each year, but not Johnston. We're not going to get rich, but it's a very good industry to be in. His son, Wade Johnston, also recently began dairy farming to create a better work-life balance for his family. Day in, day out, and it's hard work. However, I want to do something where I'm next to or near my family nearly all the time. I'm just focused on my little little tiny farm here, my little world, and I'm just trying to make everything as productive as I can and as... Uh, clean and healthy as I can. The industry has faced decades of challenges, including drought and unsustainable supermarket prices. But Dairy Australia says a growing appreciation for local produce is reviving dairy farming. There are opportunities where individual producers, individual companies are really capitalising on that support and really um, uh, working towards supplying an Australian consumer who really wants to see the Australian dairy industry succeed. And the dairy farming renaissance is providing some with record-breaking profits. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. British scientists are using high-tech acoustic tracking devices to record the return of bluefin tuna to British waters. The UK is examining the viability of a bluefin fishery where the fish could be caught for commercial or recreational purposes. We've got more from NTD's Neil Woodrow. The British team made of researchers from the University of Exeter and Plymouth University are at the first stage of trying to count the population of this fish which disappeared from British waters for decades. Right now there is no information about how many there are or why they've returned. The warm-blooded fish are prized worldwide for their taste and size, but they're also magnificent creatures to watch. 
Dr. Lucy Hawkes from Exeter University studies migrating animals. So they seem like these very exotic animals, but actually they are quite a normal part of British fauna. And we used to have quite a lot of bluefin tuna around British shores in about the 1940s and 50s before the fishery probably collapsed. Um, and they came back about sort of five to 10 years ago, and now they can be regularly spotted off the southwest coast of the UK. So they are in fact quite a British fish. They grow up to two meters in length, and although usually they live up to five to six years, some have been known to reach 15 years. In order to discover how many of the fish are in these waters and whether they return, the scientists are fitting those they can find with acoustic tags. The types of tags we've put on this year last for five years, and what they do is they literally just send out a message going, I'm fish number five, I'm fish number five. And on the seabed, we have a series of listening stations that are listening all the time for these messages from these fish. And so they record every time a fish passes past it, a bit like, I guess, an oyster card like you'd use on the tube in London. The project, called Fish Intel, is part funded by the EU's Interreg France England programme, which is establishing a network of acoustic receivers on both sides of the channel. The aim is to understand more about the tuna's movements and the habitats they prefer. It's also assessing the impact of fishing, climate factors and other human activities on the fish such as offshore renewable energy sites. Fishermen are also keen to know whether the apparent new movement of the fish to British waters could signal the development of fisheries. There are calls for a fishery to open for this species, both for the meat but also for pleasure. People like to catch and release these fish for sport. Um, and it's important to know how many of them there are to work out how many we can possibly do that with. The scientists are hoping the return of the tuna could be a sign that the waters are healthy and teeming with life. They'll eat anything small and silvery, such as herrings and sprats. You might be in a, a you know, pleasure craft of some sort off the coast and you kind of go, what the devil's going on over there? And the sea is just foaming and splashing and leaping out of the water with these massive tuna chasing these tiny silvery fish. It's a, such a cool thing to see. Dr Hawke says the tagging research will determine if it's a massive population or a precious remnant of a population. Neil Woodrow, NTD News. The Arlberg in Western Austria is one of the world's top ski resorts. It's known as the cradle of alpine skiing and home to many ski pioneers. The resort's alpine training center and a 121-year-old ski club offer a glimpse of its rich history. Let's take a look. The Arlberg Ski Resort in Austria boasts 88 lifts and cable cars and 190 miles of marked ski runs. It spreads over five main towns and villages. The Alberg's legendary status is rooted in its history, with local ski pioneers, one of whom revolutionized skiing by developing the Stem Christi technique. It's also known as the Alberg technique. It was the precursor to the parallel turn. This technique spread worldwide, and it is now taught at the Ski Austria Academy. Yes, of course, our house is an alpine skiing center. All the training courses that have something to do with alpine skiing take place here in St. Christoph, from the ski instructors to the trainers. This house has a very great tradition and history, perhaps starting with the first head, Professor Krockenhauser, who actually created the education system here. In the 1950s, this professor popularized what's known as the Vidon. It involves holding the legs very narrow and rapidly making a series of short parallel turns. This technique is revolutionary as the upper body rotates in the opposite direction of the turn. Right across from the skiing school is the 600-year-old Alberg Hospice Hotel. It was once the site of a hospice for weather-stricken hikers. It was in that simple mountain refuge in 1901 that six friends founded the ski club Alberg. I don't think that these people, these six founding members, would have thought that over 120 years later, this ski club Alberg, which is the most successful ski club in the world and which has members from over 60 countries with over 8,000 members, still exists. Many things have changed since then, but what has remained the same is a ski club Alberg emblem. The ski club has been very successful. Its members have won 91 medals at the FIS Ski World Championships and the Olympic Games. It's just so truly the center of all this ski development. I mean, we don't invent skiing. That was done by someone else. But many developments and evolutions of skiing have originated here. 
People have used skiing for thousands of years to get around. It only became a sport in the mid 1800s. Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.